Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Nudge Forum and a Keynote Plus fireside chat with Asha Jadeja Motwani, moderated by uh, Catherine Cheney. Uh, before we start the session, a few housekeeping items. The session is 30 minutes in duration. The audience will be in listen-only mode. Uh, you can put questions in the Q&A box uh, that you see towards the bottom of your screen. If you are not in the Zoom meeting room, but watching on a streaming service, you will not be able to ask questions of the panelists. On your phone, please join us on Attendify. To get the session started, I would like to introduce Catherine Cheney. Uh, Catherine is a senior reporter for DevEx, the media platform for the global development community, where she focuses on the West Coast of the US and the role of technology and philanthropy in global health, foreign aid, and humanitarian responses. Uh, she also works with the Solution Journalism Network, a nonprofit that trains journalists to cover responses to problems. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. Over to you. Thank you so much. Honored to be moderating this conversation and especially following that conversation around systems change as a lens through which to view and pursue philanthropy. Um, so we're really excited to hear from Asha Jadeja Matwani, as you just heard. Um, I'll briefly introduce her and then she's going to share a little bit about her investing journey. And from there, we'll move into Q&A. So any questions, keep them coming. Um, I certainly have questions I'm excited to ask and we'll get to those as she concludes her remarks. Uh, Asha is a Silicon Valley based venture capitalist, entrepreneur and philanthropist. She's invested in over 100 startups, including high profile companies you all know well, like Google and PayPal. And in India, her priorities have included supporting a range of sectors such as online education, women's leadership and entrepreneurship, and policy change for economic and human development. So some of the major areas we're hearing about um, today and tomorrow. And today she'll be speaking with us about her investing journey. Um, I thought it was interesting that in preparing for this talk, initially the thought was she would talk about her giving journey and she really emphasized it's, it's really investment, whether it's philanthropy or venture capital, it's investment. So I look forward to hearing about her views on that. Um, again, we'll hear from Asha over the next 10 minutes or so. Please keep questions coming and um, we'll bring in your questions at the end. So Asha, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to the nudge and uh, really excited to be here because I know that uh, some of the thoughts that I'm about to share with you will, be, um, will reach a wide, a wide audience. And uh, this is something that I think will uh, uh, you know, it's, I think one step at a time, but each, uh, you know, each drop in the bucket matters. And uh, so I would like to uh, start out by saying quickly that my main uh, sort of bread and butter, my main work actually is in venture capital. I've been investing for about uh, 20 years in uh, as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley in startups, which are uh, internet companies or they're based on, uh, you know, theoretical computer science kind of work. And uh, that's my main bread and butter. And I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of the fact that uh, when somebody makes an investment of their time or money into uh, any activity, that uh, it is it, it's really empowering for the entrepreneur to have a sense of responsibility of, uh, of saying, look, uh, they have to also uh, give back to the VC. And I, I'm a strong believer in the venture capital model. I just don't believe in things like grants where you make a huge grant and you step away. Now for certain things, I have done that for certain hospitals. I've done that recently for Sanjeevani Hospital where I invested in about a about 100 surgeries for 100 children coming from around the world for the uh, you know children who are born with the congenital heart disease. There, yes, it's okay to write a check and, and walk away because you know, you're specifically targeting something uh, where you're, you're working on somebody's, uh, you know, life-saving um, uh, project. But uh, in general, when I do philanthropic work in India, it is always through a venture capital lens of saying, how are you going to be, uh, you know, making your, your own project sustainable? How are you going to be making money? Profit is a sacred word. It is very important that in places like India, where everybody talks about philanthropy uh, without, as, as devoid of, uh, uh, of, of profit. I, I strongly disagree with that view. I actually feel that profit and sustainability must is, is, is crucial for, um, uh, you, you know, as a lens or as a paradigm for even, even in philanthropic investing. And the reason I call it investing is because I do look at my ROI. It's not just in terms of, uh, 
you know, people uh, giving any returns to me personally for my investments, but definitely uh, working on on saying what is it that you're going to be contributing to the ecosystem? What, how does that ROI pan out? I require all my recipients to give us a very strong sense of uh, return on investment. And I've noticed that it's a very empowering move when you give your entrepreneurs that sense of responsibility of, uh, uh, of, of giving you an ROI when you invest in them. So, so what did I, so how did I start my journey? What triggered my journey into India, into philanthropy? Because even in India, my initial journey was only as a venture capitalist, not as a philanthropist. And uh, the word philanthropy used to scare me because I used to think maybe it is something where, you know, uh, people write these huge grants and then they are not really involved after that. But that's not the case. What I discovered is that even in India, when you, uh, when you, when you couch your philanthropy as an investment, uh, people are, the entrepreneurs there are much more engaged with you in leveraging your resources. So for example, all the philanthropic investments that I've made in India, my entrepreneurs get back to me and they want to, want to make sure they're leveraging my resources from Silicon Valley, which is may, way more powerful than that uh, check that has been returned for their own projects. And I noticed that uh, they you know, make sure that they leverage not just the network, but also various uh, you know, venture capital investments of mine. So they leverage my portfolio companies to partner with them to, to expand their own footprint, whether it's in India or whether it's in the surrounding regions. Now, the main, the key question that started out my own philanthropic um, journey in India was how is it or why is it that Indians do fantastically well, Indian entrepreneurs do fantastically well the minute they leave India. So why is it that they are so stifled in India? Why is it that they are not able to create a large footprint in India, um, and and what 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 is that? Why is that so? And that was the question that actually got me seriously involved in the Indian ecosystem of understanding what are the policy or the bureaucratic barriers to growth in India, and this is what actually was my driving force behind my Indian philanthropy, which is I need to get to the bottom of this and figure out what's going on for. Um, uh, you know, for, so to understand why is it that Indian entrepreneurship does not blossom as well as it does in the U.S. What's what's what are the obstacles? And then I discovered that that the Indian uh, entrepreneurship, the quality of Indian entrepreneurs, is as good as anywhere else in the world. Uh, whether it's social entrepreneurs or whether it is uh, you know technology for profit entrepreneurs, the quality is the same. So what is what is stopping them to have a large footprint? And, and I discovered that it is largely, especially in IT, I'm not familiar with other sectors. In IT, it has to do with the complexity of uh, regulations and policies, uh, or what one calls bureaucratic red tape, which has been there in the Indian system ever since the British left. And a lot of that has not been addressed or reformed in the ways that it should be. Thankfully, two things have, have rebooted the Indian thinking, the Indian mindset, on what needs to be changed so that the Indian rocket ship can lift off. And what are those obstacles that need to be cut? What are those barriers that need to be removed? And uh, there are two major sort of, I would say, um, you know, two unprecedented moments in history that are conspiring uh, currently jointly at this point. One is the pandemic, like the rest of the world. The pandemic has thrown the whole Indian system and the Indian infrastructure into a, into a sense of high awareness, into a sense of uh, emergency, which is great because it's everybody is bypassing just like in the U.S. Everybody is bypassing old systems of uh, of regulations and thinking and uh, uh, you know peer reviews. And yes, there is still a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, you know focus on on uh, on quality of work that is coming out as good as sort of peer reviewed work that's coming out in terms of research. But what's also what this has done is it's rebooted Indian thinking into saying, how do we quickly fast track our velocity of change? The second thing that seems to have really energized the Indian uh, social impact sector is, uh, is the invasion, uh, is a Chinese invasion. Um, whether we, whatever we call it in the West, it is an invasion by China into Indian territory. And this is the first time that the Indian population to the last mile is familiar, is, is now has smartphones, they're connected to the internet, there is last mile internet service. 
And people are aware of the fact that India has been invaded, 20, 25 of its soldiers are killed, and that there is an incursion at the border of, and we don't know what to do about it. Because we are now dealing, suddenly dealing with an extremely powerful uh, neighbor that we have never dealt with before. And what I'm noticing in my own journey in India is that uh, I have never seen this before. I have never seen people at village level uh, being this aware of uh, the fact that something needs to change in India radically. And uh, uh, what I'm noticing is that, um, so these two factors, the pandemic and the, the Chinese uh, incursion in India are the two factors that have come together for the first time. Uh, just give me one second so that I can, uh, there is some noise in the back. Sure. So sorry, I have a gardener with a with a with a blower at the back. Can you stop him right? So, no problem. Uh, you pretty well. It's, it's a fake background. Thank you. This is better than a cat walking across my screen. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I think what is uh, what is fascinating right now is that these two factors have jump started the uh, Indian awareness on the fact that that things need to happen at a ground level. At a, you know, problem solving needs to happen at a ground level. Now, I'm happy to report that luckily for us, we started this journey eight years ago and we started it first with the Maker Fest. So what we did was we basically literally, uh, you know, worked on deploying the learnings that we had from the Maker, Fest, Maker Fair in California, which is our partner, to, uh, to bring that into the Indian, to the, to the, you know, even to small towns and villages to say, if you are a maker, if you are an inventor, or you want to problem solve for your community, you you get you wake up in the morning and you figure out who are the two people that you can impact. There is there is no need to incorporate a company. There is no need to you know don't think of a business plan. Just do what you can. If you are an inventor or an entrepreneur, do what you can for the, your immediate community. And I must say that it has this the Maker Fest that we kicked off in India has blown our socks off without doing too much heavy lifting or moderating or mediating ourselves. It has become a groundswell. It's become a social movement. So one thing that I want to share with other fellow philanthropists in India is that show your work as a pilot. If you show your work as a pilot, people who can see the benefit of these pilot projects will take it and replicate it at, at various levels. We now see Indian uh, maker festivals happening all over the country without any support from us. There are some that we feel if, you're, if they're gaining critical mass, we feel like we can put in a little bit of capital in them and accelerate them even further. But it is a beautiful thing that's going on, which is that people by themselves are picking up these nuggets of learning and they're creating their own maker festivals without any support from us. Second thing that I noticed is that if you have a good pilot, uh, what you see is that even the government actually tries to replicate that, tries to replicate your efforts. So what, at least what I noticed is that once we launched our Maker Fest in 2013, the government of India launched something called Make in India. This is great because suddenly huge amounts of uh, taxpayer money that sits with the central government is now being pumped into something called Make in India, which is an effort to get local entrepreneurs to create solutions for their local communities. And uh, this is something that has worked fantastic. Uh, second thing I noticed is, again, in, this was in 2014, what I did was I worked with uh, something called Center for Bits and Atoms in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT. And I worked with Neil Gershenfeld and his field, Professor Gershenfeld's field, uh, team, and we installed our first fab lab, a public, first public fab lab in Ahmedabad at the SEPT University. And again, what just really blew our socks off is that people from all walks of life in Ahmedabad would come in, would walk into our maker, into our fab lab and would come up with, would actually use that uh, set of tools that we had provided to create their own solutions, whether it is a prosthetic arm or whether it is, uh, you know, it, whether it is solar lights or whether it is, you know, uh, simply just beautiful objects that they could sell online. People started using our fab lab for uh, their own purposes. Now, what was beautiful is that the state of Kerala the government of Kerala immediately took notice of this, this, and I would call it our pilot, and said, hey, maybe we can set up our own fab labs. And what's amazing is that they set up 12. So we just set up one. The government of Kerala sets up 12. 
that year. And now they have, I think, total of 22 or something in the state of Kerala. So again, what is beautiful about this whole effort is that, you know, for, uh, especially for philanthropy coming from the US is use your dollars, but also use your knowledge of what is working beautifully in your own community here in the US, replicate it in certain zones in India. And the, and, and the rest is sort of, it takes on a momentum of its own. So I love this idea of us from the US who are doing philanthropy in India to showcase uh, these pilot projects beautifully and then teaching people the ropes of taking this and replicating it. On our own website on makerfest.com, you will notice that we have a, a particular you know, tab there which says, create your own Makerfest. So give people the tools to create uh, things that they, they should, um, you know, they should uh, replicate. So again, that's another example. And the final example I'll give you, we have many more, please take a look at our website, motmanijadejafoundation.com. But the one final example I'll give you is I actually uh, set up something called a school in the cloud along with uh, Professor Shugata Mitra from University of Newcastle in UK. We set up a pilot in, uh, in an all girls school in Ahmedabad, school in the cloud. All it does, it, it gives you, it gives girls an opportunity to work together in peer groups and learn your simple concepts of math and English. And um, the results from that are so phenomenal that, um, you know, Professor Mitra, for example, Asha, suddenly I'm unable to hear you. I think you might be muted. Okay. There so, you go. Uh, that, okay. So, so, so Professor Mitra actually got a TED prize for this, uh, for, uh, for the school in the cloud. And I just want, you to give you, want to give you a final example of how that pilot that we created in Ahmedabad, we replicated it in a, in a terrorist infested zone in Pakistan, in Waziristan actually. And um, I found, I stumbled upon a young couple that wanted to do this. Over phone, we spoke about this. I gave them the material. They went to uh, certain schools, which were actually religious schools in, 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 in a strong you know, terror uh, zone in Pakistan. And they created the first school in the cloud in that zone where children in the, between the ages of two and I would say maybe 10 could work together in peer groups for learning. They set up a little system for themselves and they work with the clergy. So what I'm saying is that uh, once we saw that experiment working, uh, they, this couple then needed just a little bit of seed investment from me. But by now they have over 52 schools in the cloud in extremely unstable terror zones in Pakistan. And what's, what's fascinating for me is having conversations with the clergy on phone and saying, look, how, what do you think? How do you think this is going? This is not in any way uh, opposed to any of the religious philosophies you might have. This is just empowering your own children to be more of global citizens. So once again, that was a pilot of school in the cloud that seems to have replicated itself. People are seeing value and people are, uh, are running with it. So I am a strong proponent of the believer that, and a believer that one must, as a philanthropist, create pilots because we cannot boil the ocean create pilots that, are, that others can replicate and you can quickly accelerate your own efforts for a relatively less amount of uh, cost and headaches also. So uh, uh, do you think I should stop now, uh, Catherine? Would you, do you have any questions? Let's pause if you don't mind. I do have some questions and we have some questions coming in as well. Um, thank you for that. And there are a few things you mentioned I wanna pick up on, um, including when you talk about um, philanthropists running pilots and then sharing those learnings, sort of what networks have been most useful to you in sharing those learnings. But I actually wanna start with a question related to what you brought up about the role of government. So I, I love um, what you mentioned earlier when you said this, this question, um, the key question for you is, why is it that Indian entrepreneurs do fantastically well the minute they leave India? Um, and since the start of your investing journey, there have been a lot of changes. Yes, there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape, but government has actually tried to foster entrepreneurship. The Indian government, as well as a lot of what we cover at DevEx, the role of global development actors. So USAID uh, has really pushed global entrepreneurship and ecosystems for entrepreneurship and hosted the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in India. Um, in preparing for this interview, I read that you're actually somewhat skeptical of the role government can and should play in promoting ecosystems for entrepreneurship. So can you speak to, since the start of your investment journey, um, what value have you seen 
from the Indian government or international development actors in actually improving those ecosystems for entrepreneurship in India? Or honestly, have they just gotten in the way in some senses? Uh, they have got in the way, and uh, I'll tell you how. Uh, I think it is not, it's not planned that way, of course. You know, I, think it's, I think everybody means well. What's happening is that there are legacy systems in place. So the failure is in understanding the cost and the benefit. So what's happening is you have an existing uh, set of spending that's going into certain government infrastructure. Now, what happens is um, suddenly what happened, you know, something like the prime minister would come, prime minister who, by the way, I think is a huge fan of all things startups. The prime minister came to the US, he spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley and he went back to India, rah, rah, this is the best thing we can do. You know, let's support the startup ecosystem. I think where the prime minister uh, made a mistake, which a lot of us uh, concur in the Valley, is that he handed over that project then to a bureaucrats who of course have never done a startup before. How would they know what to do? So, so instead of allocating budget to people who know what to do in creating a startup ecosystem, the, the budget was handed over to the, to the government. And so then you have these bodies like Startup India, Invest India, there's something called Niti Aayog. I mean, these are all guys who mean well, they're smart people, but they have never done a startup before. They sometimes send a few, uh, let's say, uh, you know, policy makers to, to Silicon Valley. Uh, they'll send, send a bunch of 30 people in, uh, you know, to Silicon Valley. They're flying, you know, for God knows, coach class or business class. I'm not sure. But they come to the Valley on this whole idea that we have come here to understand the Valley. In one week trip, they cannot. So the path of really enabling entrepreneurship at a ground level in India cannot be in the hands of the government. Government needs to go away completely from that. Uh, from that journey. And instead, it must leverage local Indian entrepreneurs who have, been, who have succeeded. They want to help. A lot of these people, that's, that's, that's how Silicon Valley was created, Catherine, as you know. The Valley was created by people who succeeded before, who learned, who failed, learned, failed, learned, and finally succeeded. And it is those successful entrepreneurs who then created the DNA of the Valley. It's that, so in India, it's that, that set of people who need to be leveraged we cannot leverage government officers who have never done, who have no idea what's a startup. We cannot have them. So I am really, my own journey right now, my challenge and my you know, excitement right now is in, in, in requesting the government to pull back from the startup world completely. They should not be in the mix at all. And they should not be soaking up Indian taxpayer money on that journey. That money should be going to building a people infrastructure that can really support uh, you know, entrepreneurship, even social impact entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the Indian diaspora, and I wanted to make sure to, to ask you about that. So I'd love to know what networks have been useful to you as a philanthropist. I mean, when we talk about people who were successful in Silicon Valley, many of them now are, you know, members of the Indian diaspora with, you know, means to give back to India, whether philanthropically or through investment. Um, so how, how are you tapping into that network and how can that Indian diaspora network be better leveraged to promote these ecosystems for entrepreneurship? So, so Catherine, we are already a very unified group because of Thai. Thai was an organization, a fantastic organization that was started by a generation of entrepreneurs that came before us who were actually my mentors. So you have people like Suhas Patil and Prabhu Goel and Vinod Khosla and uh, you know, Kanwal Rekhi, Suhas, you know, various people who started Thai as an organization for giving back. These were Indian entrepreneurs who were in the forefront of uh, you know, technology breakthroughs created you know, mega systems like Sun Microsystems and so on. And these are the folks who created Thai in the beginning. It's called the Indus Entrepreneurs. It's an organization which is now has uh, you know, membership of literally thousands, I mean hundreds of thousands of people across the globe. But the Valley chapter is the strongest. It's the oldest, it's the founding chapter. And as a result of, because of Thai, we are all already fairly well connected and we are on a regular, you know, uh, we, we, we interact very regularly. So I'm absolutely leveraging the diaspora for everything. And, uh, you know, we, we speak constantly, we talk about the fact, and that's why we are all so familiar with the barriers of growth in India. And uh, we have been fighting this battle for 20 years. So a lot of what you see right now, for example, the, the telecommunications uh, revolution that happened in India happened because of a gentleman who went back from Chicago, you know, San Petroda went back from Chicago 
to India. And at that time, he spoke to the then prime minister and said, look, let me give me the freedom to jump, to leapfrog India from, uh, from you know, from, uh, uh, from, from the old communication systems that we own phone lines that we had to mobile phone systems. And this is, we are talking 19, uh, 1990s. And he leapfrogged the country. One man with an idea that to how to leapfrog was finally given an infrastructure by the then prime minister and actually created a revolution in India. Similarly, I wish that there were uh, more such opportunities for people who've been there, done that, uh, to, to do this. Uh, and I wish sadly that we did not threaten the Indian bureaucracy. Those of us from the diaspora, when we go to back to India with ideas, we threaten the Indian bureaucracy. They don't like us. And, uh, and I can understand because they are sitting on inordinate amount of power and, uh, and, and, and purse strings. And they don't want to give that up, of course. Uh, but it's it's leaving the country poor and Im impoverished and 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 you know and it's a it's it's a, it's a sad thing. I just I hope that we can convince the bureaucracy to not be involved in the tech sector or in the startup world at all. It should be in the hands of people who have done it before. I want so to. The diaspora is very unified, Catherine. Diaspora is very mm -hmm. unified. Yeah, that's good to hear. And I think now the challenge is um, you know helping the government see the value of that and tap into that network more effectively. Um, there's a question that's come in from the audience. We only have a couple seconds left, but there's a question about impact investing and the role of impact investing. So we've talked venture capital, philanthropy, um, your views on both. Uh, can you speak to impact investing as a way of investing in India and measuring outcomes? I think the best way to do that, if you really want to go seriously into impact investing, is partner with somebody. So for example, two, two things, two or three things that I support pretty heavily are Pratham, which is for education, Akshay Patra, which is for meals for children, and the third is Foundation for Excellence, which is based in Silicon Valley, but it works for works on children coming from extremely poor backgrounds, the, some of the smartest kids, and giving them a chance to go to college. So these three things I piggyback on. So I would say for impact investing, piggyback on something on the ground that's already got great momentum. They are doing fantastic, they have results, and they have an existing organizational structure that delivers all the metrics so that uh, you know they can um, they can raise funds from everywhere. Um, these entities are already working with various foundations, Rockefeller, you know, Gates Foundation, then there are many other foreign foundations that they work with. So I personally believe that family foundations like ours must partner with uh, you know with some other uh, foundations or with entities that have uh, you know, escape velocity in India. Great. We're almost out of time here. It's gone by really quickly, but um, I just wanted to make sure to give you the last word. Um, I gave you a heads up, Asha, that I love to end with some kind of call to action. And I, I've noticed this, this agenda seems quite action oriented. So what would you like to leave the audience with in terms of a final thought or an action you hope they take when we step away from Zoom? I want them to come to Motwani Jadeja Foundation, take a look at some of the projects we are doing and pick one that you like. And I would strongly recommend taking a maker fest. Create a maker fest in your own community. If you're a young person who's looking to do something fun and interesting, which is highly impactful and can create livelihoods, please come to Motwani Jadeja Foundation or Maker Fest website and join us. Wonderful. Well, with that, we will close on time. It was a pleasure to speak with you and connect with the rest of you virtually. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a ton. Uh, thank you, Asha and Catherine, for a very interesting conversation.